Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you have had a fantastic Tuesday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. And a quick note before we get started. Today on this channel, I actually uploaded an extra news video. And for the same reason we've had to do this in the past, it is a, a truly troubling and horrifying story, the kind that YouTube usually suppresses. So we always try and separate those from the regular show. But yeah, after this video, I highly recommend you watch it. But with that said, welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up hit that like button and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today are huge updates regarding the situation with Ellen. You know, since we last talked about this, there have been new updates almost every single day. So to try to play some catch up here, several former employees of the Ellen DeGeneres show have said that the set is very hostile and a toxic workplace. Some accusing top producers of creating this environment, others saying Ellen herself should be held responsible for what happens on her show. Warner Media then responded by saying they'd be conducting an investigation into all of this. And so now we actually have a couple of bigger things happening with several reports saying that executive producer Ed Glavitt, who is actually accused of reprimanding a black employee for speaking up about representation and asking for a raise could likely be exiting the show. Late last week, Ellen also made a statement about everything herself, writing in a letter to the show's staff. On day one of our show, I told everyone in our first meeting that the Ellen DeGeneres show would be a place of happiness. No one would ever raise their voice and everyone would be treated with respect. Obviously, something changed and I am disappointed to learn that this has not been the case. I could not have the success I've had without all of your contributions. My name is on the show and everything we do and I take responsibility for that. She also talked about the investigation and said she is committed to making changes and preventing future issues. But that is not where the story ends because now there are even more accusations being hurled at producers of the show. These accusations coming from a BuzzFeed news report where several people accused three top level staff of sexual assault and harassment. This including head writer and executive producer Kevin Lehman with one former employee saying that Lehman asked him if he could give him a hand job or perform oral sex while at a company party. Another saying they saw him grab a production assistant's penis. Also almost a dozen people saying that it was common for him to make inappropriate sexual comments and jokes. Now on the other side of this, he has denied this, telling BuzzFeed that these allegations in their article was malicious and misleading. Though he was also not the only one implicated in this piece. You had Ed Glavin accused of inappropriately touching women, with dozens of former employees saying that he had a reputation for being handsy with women. BuzzFeed also reporting that 47 employees told them that he led with intimidation and fear on a daily basis. And as far as Glavin's response, according to BuzzFeed, he did not respond to a request for comment on the story. Also in another case, a co-executive producer by the name of Jonathan Norman was accused of grooming a former employee employee by taking him to concerts and giving them other perks. Then one night attempting to perform oral sex on him. This reportedly was corroborated by three former employees. But on the other side of this, you have Norman denying these accusations to Buzzfeed, claiming that they are coming from someone with ulterior motives. Now with all of this coming out, we've also seen a lot of rumors as to what happens next. This including the rumor and possibility that Ellen might actually be exiting the show, fearing the damage done to her brand is irreparable. This, even though you had producers seemingly denying it, right? Still, you had reports speculating that James Corden could actually replace her. You also had replace Ellen trending on Twitter with people throwing out their own suggestions. But despite all those rumors, those suggestions, it has now been confirmed to NBC News as of this morning that Ellen will come back to film her 18th season. Though of course, as life has continually shown us, anything can change at any time. You know, with all of this, you had a lot of people chiming in on this subject about Ellen, her reputation in general. To oversimplify it, you essentially had Team Ellen is good and Team Ellen is bad camps. On the Ellen is bad side, you had people like Brad Garrett from Everybody Loves Raymond saying, no more than one who were treated horribly by her, common knowledge. You also had people like Leah Thompson from Back to the Future responding to an article about it saying that it was true. Then on the Ellen is good side, you had people like her wife posting an I stand by Ellen graphic on Instagram. Country singer Brandi Carlisle also commenting on that saying Ellen has made her life and the lives of other LGBTQ people easier, calling the attack unprecedented. You also had Katy Perry tweeting last night, I know I can't speak for anyone else's experience besides my own, but I want to acknowledge that I have only ever had positive takeaways from my time with Ellen and on the Ellen show. I think we all have witnessed the light and continual fight for equality that she has brought to the world through her platform for decades. Sending you love and a hug, friend. We've also seen big requests that other celebrities like Jennifer Aniston, Jennifer Lopez, Michelle Obama, Pink, Sean Hayes, Lady Gaga, Oprah, and Justin Timberlake, that they show their support for Ellen during this time. Though I, I will say with this story, I, I think it is important to point out that what we're talking about here are two drastically different situations, right? There are the allegations that Ellen DeGeneres, not actually the nicest person in the world. Maybe cold, weird, mean, standoffish, right? That is one situation itself. It's something that we've seen stories popping up in the past of people saying, you know, share your, your worst Ellen story, right? So there's that story and those accusations, but then I would say arguably the much bigger and separate though, 
connected in that Ellen is the name of the show, are the accusations against senior staff of harassment, sexual harassment, discrimination, grooming, right? Things that if we are to believe Warner Media are being investigated right now. But for now, that is essentially where we are with this situation. And I do want to pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts here? But from that, I want to share some stuff I love today. And today in Awesome, brought to you by Phil.ting.com. You know, with this pandemic and social distancing, I know a lot of you are spending more time at home, probably also looking for more ways to make every dollar count. And that is actually where Ting comes in because switching to Ting saves you money. I actually just found out that Ting is offering a $50 credit for the month of August. So there's even more savings than ever. And with Ting, you already start at just $6 per line, only paying for the talk, text, and data that you actually use each month. So basically, if you use less one month, you pay less, no contracts, overage fees, or any other carrier tricks, it is just simple. And if you didn't know, almost any phone works with Ting. And the more phones that you add to your plan, the less you pay per device. Plus, Ting now has Verizon, the largest, most reliable network in the United States. So if you've wanted to save with Ting in the past, but you couldn't switch due to coverage issues, now is the time to head over to phil.ting.com and get $50 off your bill. And the first bit of awesome is, you know, every now and then I give a recommendation for a movie, a game, today a TV show. And today, that TV show is The Umbrella Academy Season 2. This part is just my opinion. I think it is arguably better than Season 1. And after finishing it, I am just absolutely craving a Season 3. But now, since I finished this new season, I'll just have to wait for Season 2 of The Boys, which, actually a piece of awesome today, is they released the final trailer for Season 2 of The Boys, which, hey, if you haven't yet watched the first season of the show, you got some time till September. Then we had Kate Davis on Tiny Desk Home Concert. We had Binging with Babbage giving us fire flakes from Avatar The Last Airbender. We got a forensics detective reviewing crime scene investigations from Dexter to CSI Miami. And the final bit of awesome is actually some entertainment news, more of the digital going mainstream, with the most recent example of this now being the internet's own David Dobrik. According to The Hollywood Reporter, we'll be hosting a series on the Discovery Channel. It is a new dodgeball competition series, which sounds just like the kind of stupid I need in my life right now. Reportedly, the competitors will range from professional athletes to those who have never played a sport in their life. Reportedly, Aaron Lim and Andrew Hawkins will co-host the series with him. And fantastically, you do not have to wait long. It will be premiering on August 19th. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, really anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then we should talk about this now massively viral interview between President Trump and Axios political correspondent Jonathan Swan. Now, the full interview is about 37 minutes. I highly, highly recommend you watch the full thing. It's over on HBO's YouTube channel. That video, as I'm recording, has already gotten more than 2.2 million views, which is a lot, but a lot less than some of the other clips that have now gone viral. Though among the clips that have blown up, hugely important topics. Things like Swan talking about and questioning Donald Trump regarding the rate of COVID-19 deaths in the United States. And if you look at death, yeah, it started to go up again. One. Well, right here, the United States is lowest in numerous categories. Uh, we're lower than the world. Lower than we're the lower world? than what is that? Europe. In Take what? Look. In what? Take a look. Right here. Here's case death. Oh, you're doing death as a proportion of cases. I'm talking about death as a proportion of population. That's where the US is really bad. Well, well, Much worse than South Korea, Germany, et cetera. You can't, you can't do that. You have Why to go, can't I do that? You have to go by, you have to go by where, look, here is the United States. You have to go by the cases, the cases. Why not death. as a proportion of when population? When have somebody, what it says is when you have somebody that yeah. has, it, where there's a case, oh, okay. the people that live sure. from oh. those cases. It's surely a relevant statistic to say if the US has X population and X percentage of death of that population no, versus South Korea. No, you have Korea. to go by the cases. Well, look at South if, Korea, for example. 51 million population, 300 deaths. It's like, it's you, crazy you compared to know that. Country. I do, it's you on don't the, know it's that. Do, you think they're faking their statistics, uh, South Korea? I, I, I won't get into country? that because they have a very good relationship yeah. with the country, but you don't know that. Donald Trump also saying his administration has done an incredible job handling the pandemic. Also saying that the outbreak here is quote, under control as much as you can control it. And if it's not already apparent to you as far as why this has been widely scrutinized, I, I do want to focus on this. Right, as Swan points out, COVID cases do not seem to be under control in the United States. In fact, even as of this morning, the United States still undoubtedly leads the world in cases 4.7 million out of 18.3 million. Right, but also in addition to the number of cases, you had Swan pointing out that last week, a thousand Americans were dying each day from the coronavirus, which we saw Trump pushing back, saying that the media isn't reporting stats correctly, asking shouldn't his administration get credit for testing more vigorously than in other countries. And because we do more tests, we have more cases. In other words, we test more, we have, but, now take a look. The top one, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. 
the, the top, Jonathan. If, 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 if hospital top, rates were going it's down it's and deaths true. were going down, I'd say terrific. You deserve to be praised for well, testing, they but even, they're all going you know, up. They very rarely Hosp talk. 60,000 Americans are in hospital. If you watch the Thousand news dying or read the papers, they usually talk about new cases, new cases, new cases. I'm talking about death. Well, you look it's at death. Up. Death is way down from where it was. Okay, so let's talk about that claim that death is way down from where it was, because yes, that is true, but as Swan pointed out, it is misleading. Deaths actually spiked in April and in the beginning of May. In fact, at one point, we saw daily death tolls reaching 2,700. But as May continued, we started to see that death toll fall falling so much so that we actually started seeing less than a thousand deaths a day by mid-June. However, that number started climbing back up again early last month, eventually going over that 1,000 deaths per day mark. Which is why you had Swan asking Trump these questions and really pressing Trump about the growing death rate, but even still, you had Trump saying, But now it's going down again. It's, it's going, going down in Arizona. It's going down in Florida. Nationally it's going down up. in Texas. Take a look at this. These are the tests. It's going down in Florida? Now there, because this interview was filmed last Tuesday regarding Florida, it is possible that Trump was referring to a four-day dip in coronavirus deaths that we saw from July 24th to July 27th. But as has been pointed out before, that's just not a long enough period of time to say that cases are definitely decreasing. In fact, the day of this interview, Florida even reported its highest death toll yet, with a new record then being set each day for the next three days in a row. And while yes, so far, deaths thankfully do seem to be decreasing in Arizona, in Texas, that doesn't seem to be the case yet. And so one of the things that really stood out to me in this interview was Swan saying to the president, you have so much power when it comes to your supporters. That's a power that needs to be used responsibly. You know, I've covered you for a long time. I've, I've gone to your rallies. I've talked to your people. They love you. They listen to you. They listen to every word you say. They hang on your every word. They don't listen to me or the media or Fauci. They think we're fake news. They want to get their advice from you. And so when they hear you say everything's under control, don't worry about wearing masks, I mean, these are people, many of them are older people, well, what's Mr. President. What's your definition of control? Yeah, under the it's giving them a false sense right of security. Now, I think it's under control. I'll tell you what. How? A thousand Americans are dying a day. They are dying. That's true. And you ha it is what it is. But that doesn't mean we aren't doing everything we can. Right. How many months did it take this guy just to wear a mask? And how many of us then saw Trump supporting friends or relatives then switch their opinion on masks? And it just creates a situation where you're like, is he just delusional? Is he actively lying? Are the people around him not giving him the real situation? Because it doesn't seem like he understands the full scale of this pandemic. And at the very least, when, when you get to the topic of over 1,000 Americans dying per day, why do you have a president that's that says it is what it is. But once again, I'll always give you the news, I'll give you my opinion, and of course, I'll pass the question off to you, but I also want you to try to educate yourself on this. Whether you're someone that agrees with me, you disagree with me, maybe you're on the fence, one, I would recommend you watch the full interview. I actually think Swan does a much better job of interviewing Trump than many of the mainstream media people that I've seen do it. There are places that he really pushes back on the president. For example, you have these clips about coronavirus testing and mail-in ballots. And you know, there are those that say, you can test too much, you do know that. Who says that? Oh, just read Who? the manuals, read the books. Manuals? Read the what books. Manuals? Read the books. What books? They're sending out. Applications. Governors. Download them Millions of ballots. No, they're not. There it's is, applications. You can get there them There is the no way you can go through a mail-in vote without massive cheating. I honestly don't understand this topic with, with go you. Go ahead. The Republican Party has an extremely well-funded vote-by-mail program. Your campaign puts out emails telling people to vote by mail. Correct. Your daughter-in-law, Lara Trump, she did robocalls in California saying it's safe and secure, mail-in voting. And there are also places where he just allows him to speak and you kind of get what you'd expect. This including moments like when Swan asked Donald Trump about the legacy of the now late representative John Lewis. John Lewis is lying in state in the US Capitol. How do you think history will remember John Lewis? I don't know, I really don't know. Uh, I don't know, uh, I don't know John Lewis. Uh, he chose not to come to my uh, uh, inauguration. Uh, he chose, uh, I, I don't, uh, I never met John Lewis, actually, I don't believe. Do you find him impressive? Uh, I can't say one way or the other. I find a lot of people impressive. I find many people not impressive, but no, but I didn't go. Do you find his story he didn't impressive? Come, he didn't come to my inauguration. He didn't come to my State of the Union speeches, and that's okay, that's his right. And. Again, nobody has done more right. the, for the, the, black Americans than I have. I understand. He should have come. The, I think he made a big mistake. The, the, I think he should have come. taking your relationship with him out of it, do you find his story impressive, what he's done for uh, this country? He was a person that devoted a lot of energy and a lot of heart to civil rights 
but there were many others also. Yeah, once again, there's a lot more. No matter where you stand, I highly recommend you watch the full interview. And of course, from there, judge for yourself. But with all of that said, I do want to pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts when you've watched this interview, you've seen clips of this interview? And that is where I'm going to end today's show. As always, to the three of you still here, thanks for being a part of these daily dives into the news. If one of you also happens to be new, definitely hit that subscribe button, tap that bell to turn on notifications. Also, if you're looking for more to watch, maybe you missed yesterday's seemingly suppressed Philip DeFranco show or today's extra heavy news video. Click or tap right there to watch either of those right now. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.